So, we've been in this study on the significance of 40 for a couple of weeks now. And uh, we've seen the significance of 40 in the life of Noah. And uh, we've, we've seen it in the life of Moses and all the different aspects of, was it locked? Oh, sorry. Uh, all the different aspects of, of Moses' life and just amazing how, how, you know, something that we take for granted, you know, a 40-year period or a 40-day period and how it really means so much in Scripture. So as we look at this, you know, this number 40, whatever that period of time is, usually brings new life or brings a, a new beginning, a new challenge, or just a transition. You know, as we know, a typical pregnancy is 40 weeks. So, you know, God still uses that to bring new life, you know. So we don't often think about that. But it's there for a reason. And while we've, while we've already seen Israel had, had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of faith and because of their disbelief with God, and, and this, this period of 40 is apparently a constant in their history. So today, we're going to look at that period of 40 in the history of Israel. So Israel alone, we've seen them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, but what else can we see in Israel regarding this number 40? First of all, I want you to turn to Judges chapter 13, Judges 13, and we see here that Israel was delivered to the Philistines for 40 years. Israel was delivered to the Philistines for 40, 40 years. Judges 13 and verse 1. Notice this. And the children of Israel did evil again, how to underline that, in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Amazing when you think about this. Is if you've ever read the book of Judges, you know that it's a constant roller coaster ride with the children of Israel. Uh, I mean, they, they, they'll have a righteous judge, they'll have a godly judge, and everything's going well, and they're, they're serving the Lord, and the nation's being blessed, and then that judge dies off, and Israel will do evil in the sight of the Lord. And it's almost, almost every other chapter that says, and so-and-so died, and Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's just crazy. And it sometimes leaves me scratching my head thinking, when are you people going to get it? <laughs> when are you going to understand that you can't rebel against God? But don't we have the same problem? You know, it's real easy for us to criticize Israel because we read about this so constantly. And we see them constantly refusing to serve God or refusing to believe God or refusing to do right. But we do the same thing. Because, you know, maybe we don't like a certain situation or we don't like what we read in the Bible or we don't like what the preacher said or we get angry at somebody and, and we want to lash out and we're just as bad. We, we have that constant roller coaster ride with God too and we shouldn't as much as Israel shouldn't. But again, we see this in chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, again. <laughs> I mean, almost as if to say, here we go again. Israel did evil in the sight of God. And God, again, reaches a point where he says, I'm done. I I I've, I've had enough. You know, it's as if, you know, he's saying, you know... How many times can you get away with this? How many times can I chastise you? And you're not getting the point. So God says, all right, I'm done. I'm going to turn you over to your enemy. I'm going to surrender you or deliver you to the enemy that you've been fighting all these years. You know, Israel had a, had a, a constant history with the Philistines. I mean, the Philistines were always a part of Israel history, all the way back to even Abraham and Isaac. You know, Abraham made a covenant with King Abimelech and received land from him. And they had a covenant of peace, but then the same uh, Philistine king, Abimelech, was the one that Isaac lied to about Rebekah, saying that Rebekah was his sister, 
for fear that they would kill him and steal his wife because they knew the Philistines were wicked people. <laughs> but yet they're dwelling in their land. They have this history. They have this, this common uh, ancestry, if you will, so to speak, because they're in the same region. And, and, you know, we think about how God led the children of Israel through the, the lands of the Philistines and, and promised to give them the land. Just on and on and on, we see all the Philistines always there. When, when Joshua is an old man, God tells Joshua to divide the last of the Philistine lands that are left by the last the remaining five kings. So they're always there. All throughout the book of Judges, the Philistines are fighting with Israel. And here God says, you continue to disobey me. You continue to do evil. You continue to turn your back on me. So... He turned them over to the Philistines. Almost the same way as in Romans chapter 1 when the people refused to acknowledge God as God. And what did he do? He turned them over to a reprobate mind. He said, all right, I'm going to give you what you want. You want to live that way? You can live that way. You know, he'll do the same thing with us. Well, when we continue to reject him, we continue to reject his ways, we continue to reject his word, and we continue to live the way we choose to live, whether it's right or wrong, God says, okay, is that what you want? You can have it. God never forces anyone to worship him. God wants us to freely choose to worship. And when we choose not to do what God wants, then there are consequences. And that's what this is. This period of 40 years is a 40-year chastisement for Israel. But I want you to notice something. You know, God will, God will allow the, the worst possible scenario in your life to get you to make that turn. But within this 40-year punishment, God also makes a way of escape. Notice verse 2. Beginning in verse 2, it says, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not. But thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. How many times has God done this in Scripture? You ever think about that? The woman's barren, but yet God gives her a child. For a specific purpose. This is for a specific purpose. The children of Israel are going through a 40-year punishment, and God says, I need to make a way for them to escape this punishment. Verse 4, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Obviously, we know we're talking about Samson. Now, think about this. God deals out the punishment. He says, all right, you're going to be delivered to your enemies, the wicked, vile Philistines, for a period of 40 years. But in that 40-year period, God presents the opportunity for escape. He gives a barren woman a child who will grow to be Samson. He says here, there's not going to be a razor upon his head because he's going to be a Nazarite from birth. We ought to do a lesson on that sometime. But being a Nazarite does not... You know, how many times have you heard, well, Jesus had long hair because he was a Nazarite? No, he wasn't. He lived in Nazareth at the time of his ministry or at the time of a child. He came from Nazareth. He was not a Nazarite. A Nazarite vow was something that the, the priest would take for a period of time. They would set themselves apart. They would not shave. They would not cut their hair. They would not drink wine. They would not do anything for a period of time. And at the end of that period of time, they would go clean themselves up and get back to work. But, but God is saying, this child, this, this Samson, he's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be separated to me from birth. This is what makes him special. This is what makes him different. Because he's going to deliver the people from the Philistines. Now, this is probably, and mo most Bible scholars would agree with this from what I've read, probably about 20 years into this punishment. 
Samson would be born. And then probably around the age of 20, he would become the judge that would deliver them from the Philistines. Now, they wouldn't necessarily be driving them out because he continued to fight with them. But they would have the protection of Samson. And how many hundreds of thousands of Philistines did Samson kill? Because he was protecting the children of Israel. And it's just amazing that even in this punishment, God makes a way to escape. Even when we fail God, even when we disappoint God, even when we reject his ways, God says, okay, I'm going to let you have the punishment. I'm going to let you have your way and you're going to mess up your life. But hey, I'm always here. I'm ready to take you back. And there's a way to come back. Isn't this amazing? God never leaves us out there on our own. Even, you know, even in Romans, as I mentioned, he turned them over to a reprobate mind. You realize that even turning them over to a reprobate mind, if they had repented and come back to God, it would have been over. And that's the amazing thing about God. No matter how severely we fail, God is always there with open, loving arms to say, welcome back. Because the Israel took their land. God promised the land of the Philistines, the, the, this region, to, to Israel. And again, why, why do people hate Israel today? They're God's chosen people. It's their land. It, right, it is their land. You know, it, it's not, you know, we look, we look at Palestine today. That's not Palestinian land. That is Israel. That is their land. God gave that to them. They inherited that from God. So we need to understand, this is why people hate Israel. Because God has blessed them. I mean, you, you realize, I'm kind of off track, but you realize how much technology has come out of Israel? You know the cell phones were invented in Israel? It's, it's amazing. Yeah, they're good with them. <laughs> they know how to make them blow up. <laughs> but, but they're just an amazingly advanced knowledgeable, wise people because God has given them that blessing. Oh, the Iron Dome, what an amazing, several years ago, again, we're off topic, but it's okay. This is still kind of topic. You know, when, when Hezbollah was fighting Israel years ago, and it was actually a, a headlining news article where this reporter had interviewed one of the Hezbollah generals and said, why are your missiles not hitting your targets? This was his response. Speaking of Israel, their God changes the trajectory of our missiles in midair. <laughs> that was his statement. You can look it up. Yeah. It was on the front page of the news. Wouldn't that be enough? That's what I said. <laughs> Aren't you thinking, well, we're not going to win this if their God is changing our missile's trajectory. But that is how much people hate Israel. In all honesty, folks, that's how much people hate our God. Because it's not about Israel. It's about a hatred of God and all things that are of God. It's about all things that are Christ. Because what are, what are the chants of the of the Muslim terrorist. First comes Saturday, then comes Sunday. What they mean by that is first we destroy Israel, then we destroy America. Israel's the little Satan, America's the big Satan in the eyes of these Muslim terrorists. So we're on the target list and they're coming for us as well because they hate our God. And that's what's going on here. God says, okay, you don't want me? You don't want my ways? You don't want to listen to me? You don't want my blessings? I'm just going to turn you over to your enemies. Let's see how you fare then. Let's see how things go for you then when your enemies are in control. But at the same time, I'm going to make a way for you to come back. And I'm going to give a barren woman a child that's going to be set apart to me from his birth. What an amazing picture of God's grace and mercy. Because the way of escape is right there. All you have to do is accept this way of escape. And we're back in fellowship. Isn't this good? I mean, think about it. It doesn't matter what we do. The way of escape is always there. We just turn back to God. God, forgive me. 
again, I was talking to that man at, at the prison last night, and he said, you know, I've asked God many times to, to come into my heart. And, you know, I've said, Jesus, I accept your way. I said, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. How have you done that if you've done that several times? And I gave him an analogy. I said, let's, let's look at it this way. He had no children. So I said, let's think about your mother. And you hurt your mother's feelings. You disappointed your mother. And you went to your mother and you said, oh, mama, all right, forgive me. I'm sorry. Do you think she's going to accept that apology? And he said, well, no, it's not sincere. I said, okay, what if you came to your mother and you said, oh, mom, I, 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 I did not mean to hurt you that way. I, will you ever forgive me? I, I'm so sorry. Can you forgive me? I said, do you see the difference? He said, yeah, that sounds sincere. I said, you can't come to God and say, oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. No, you have to be repentant. Repentance is a change of mind. When we change our mind and we agree with God and we say, okay, God, I, I know this is wrong. I know I shouldn't have done this. Please forgive me. Not only forgive me, but help me not to do that again. You know, give me the strength to overcome this whatever it is. And that's the difference. And so when we do that with God, he says, okay, welcome back to fellowship. Because he gives us that way of escape just like he did with Israel. Every time Israel failed, God gave them a way of escape. And all they had to do was accept that way. So we see Israel, they're, they're turned over to their enemies, the Philistines, for a period of 40 years. But notice this. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Not only do we see they're turned over to the Philistines for 40 years, but also the Philistines again. We see that Israel was taunted by Goliath for 40 days. There's that number again. Remember, 40. It's, it's a beginning, a new beginning, a new life, a, a transition, a new change. It means that things are about to be different, this period of 40 whatever. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17, look at verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at, at Soko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Soko and Azekah, and Espadamanim, that's a love that lovely name, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his, his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set up your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose ye a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day to give me a man, and we may fight together. Then Saul and all Israel heard those words, the Philistine, words of the Philistine, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, notice this, and we've looked at this several times. So we see this picture, all of Israel. I mean, this is a mighty army. And God has given them victory after victory after victory. And here they are once again fighting the Philistines, and the Philistines send out Goliath, this giant, who's a little over nine feet tall. I mean, he's a huge man, massive man trained in all types of war. He's, he's a, a, basically a soldier for hire. And so he's out there saying, you, you send me a champion, we'll fight, and if you win, we'll serve you, blah, blah, blah. All right? So we, we know the story. And every time I read this, it never ceases to amaze me that all of Israel is cowering in fear over this one man. But notice verse 16. Verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Hmm. 
There's that number again. Why is that so significant? Because again, something is about to happen. God uses this period for a time of transition, a time of new beginning. This 40 is not insignificant. Something is about to happen because God has placed this challenge, if you will, in front of Israel, and He's come out here for 40 days. God has allowed this 40-day challenge because He wants to bring this great nation change. He's trying to show them, you need me. I want you to get that. I want you to understand that. They're all cowering in fear. They're, they're shaking in their sandals, okay? They, they don't want to fight this champion. They don't want to go down. So what happens at the end of these 40 days? Well, even though he's not yet taken the throne, David has been anointed king and won't take the, the throne for roughly 14 years from this point. But David has already been anointed. He's coming into the battle. He arrives on this scene. He arrives to see all of Israel cowering in fear. And he, he arrives to hear this challenge from Goliath. And look what happens in verse 22. Verse 22. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And he talked with them. Behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now all of Israel's heard this for 40 days. This is the first time David's hearing it. And notice this, verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men and stood by him, saying, What shall be done to this man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Everybody see that? I mean, you understand that, that most Bible scholars believe that David was about 17 years old when he arrives at this battle. So all of Israel's cowering in fear over this giant that's standing in the valley, and David shows up, hears this challenge for, 40 for the first time. They've heard it for 40 days. He hears it for the first time, and he says, what's going to be done to this guy? I mean, he, he's defying the Lord God. He's defying Israel. Why are we allowing this to happen? And David's ready to go fight. Forty days have passed. You see in this? David arrives on the scene. You see, David is the change. David is the new life. Once David arrives at this battle, everything turns. You get in this picture? So God spent 40 days proving to Israel just how weak they were and proving to Israel that they didn't have what it took without God because David never took credit for anything. Nowhere in this passage, even after David kills Goliath and everyone sings his praises, David never takes credit for this battle. David always gives credit to God. God is wonderful. God is great. God, David loved God. David followed God. David served God. David had a heart for God. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. I, I mean, David was, was the one to come into Israel and put them on the right path. But it took this 40-day challenge for them to see we need change. We need something different. And this transition takes place when David steps into that valley, kills Goliath, and they all realize this is an amazing man. He has come in the power of God. See in this? I mean, we know the story. We don't have to go over it all the time, but we know that David is a man of God, and we know that he's greatly used by God. David has, has experienced God's hand in his life. He even tells that to Saul. God delivered me from the hand of the bear and from the hand of the lion. I mean, can you just imagine this, this young whippersnapper? You know, all the armies of Israel are in fear and here's this child that says, I can kill this guy because God is with me. 
My God will deliver him into my hands. Don't let him defy our God. And 40 days he did this until David showed up. And everything changed. What an amazing picture. You know, many times we, we think about a trial and, you know, we, we ask ourselves why and what's going on and what's happening. But God always allows trials in our lives to draw us closer to him. Now, I'm not saying every trial we go through is 40 days or 40 years or anything. Sometimes it feels like that, you know, but, you know, God allows these trials to draw us closer to him and to help us understand that we need him. And in Israel, in the history of Israel, he used these periods of 40 years or 40 days to draw them to him and to help them see he is what they need. They can't figure this out on their own. They can't take care of their problem. They need God. Even when David showed up on the sea, David wasn't the hero. He may have been touted as the hero, but David said, oh no, this is God. This is my God that did this. And it was David that turned Israel back to God and led them into a time of plenty and a time of, uh, of just great wealth because David was an amazing king, a warrior king. As we mentioned earlier, he killed a lot of people in a lot of not so nice ways, but, but he did it by the power of God. So God allowed this time of 40 days for Goliath to come out and ridicule them. And, you know, and they never would have had a, a, an opportunity to see David shine in the glory of God had they not had this period of 40 days of rejection and, and ridicule. You think about that. If they would have just attacked, who knows what would have happened. But God used this period. Not only that, but... Take your Bibles and turn back to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. So we saw that you know, Israel was taunted by Goliath for 40 days. We saw that, that they, were, they were delivered to the Philistines for 40 years. But notice this. In Judges chapter 3, we also see... You know, and I know some of you are going to say, well, this is before chapter 13. Well, obviously. But this is showing that pattern again. We're going back to the beginning here. And Israel had rest 40 years. I want you to see this. Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Imagine that. <laughs> wow, we're, here we are on this pattern again. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushash Rishonim. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely name? <laughs> That's a $20 moniker right there. The king of Mesopotamia and the children of Israel served Cushan Rishonim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, you see the turn? When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushath Arishanim, king of Mesopotamia, unto his hand, and his hand prevailed. Why do they have to keep saying this name? <laughs> they prevailed unto him. <laughs> and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Now, I want you to get this picture. As I've mentioned, here's this roller coaster ride. They do evil, they get judged, they get punished. They cry out to God, and God delivers them. Isn't this an amazing picture? I mean, you could go through the book of Judges and say, this is my life. I'm trusting God, everything's going good, and oh, yeah, yeah, I messed up, I blew it. Now I gotta get back, I gotta get right with God. I'm going to trust God, everything's going good, oh, then I blow it. Oh, then I've got to get back to God, I've got to trust God, I've got to get it right. This is what's going on with Israel. You know, and again, we criticize them for this, but we do the same thing. And so it says they do evil in the sight of God. And so because they do evil in the sight of God, God once again, he delivers them into the hand of this, this Philistine king or, or this, this wicked king. And so it says here that they, they not only forgot God, but they began to serve Balaam. Now, we've talked about this before. This is the worship of Baal and all of the attributes of Baal. So Balaam is not the God. Balaam is the practice of worshiping Baal. 
they not only worshipped Baal, this Phoenician god, but they also worshipped the groves, which was the, where they had the statues of Astaroth, the Phoenician goddess that always went along with Baal. And so they're worshiping these false idols, they're worshiping these false gods, and in verse 8, God gets so angry with them that he, he sell, sells them to the king of Mesopotamia. What is his name again? <laughs> <laughs> Sound it out, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was even practicing that name last night. Is it <laughs> yeah. Just say it fast. Say it fast, you sound intelligent. <laughs> hey, Kushi, come here. <laughs> so, so verse 8, he sells them to this king of Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia was actually a collection of different cultures to create one nation. So it was a region between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, which is modern-day Iraq or Kuwait. So trying to give you a picture of where these people are at. And so, you know, this tension has been in this Middle Eastern region since the beginning. So, you know, we, we sometimes wonder, you know, why are they attacking Israel? Well, here you go. I mean, it's a history of this. It's just nonstop. So, the, they're made up of the Sumerians, the, the Assyrians, the, the Akkadians, and the Babylonians. So, and, and this is where eventually the, the Philistines come into the scene as well. So, it's just nonstop. They're, they're always battling these people. But God actually sells Israel to this king. I don't know what he got for him, you know, <laughs> but it probably wasn't much. So God turns him over to King Cushatharishim. <laughs> there you go, Jim. <laughs> and they serve him for eight years, but eight years, the number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. <laughs> You know, maybe we just need to do a numerology study. <laughs> so the number eight is the, the new beginnings or regeneration. And so after this eight-year period, the people begin again to cry out to God. And God sends Othniel, who is Caleb's nephew, to come and deliver them from this oppressor. And delivers them out of their bondage and Israel has a 40-year respite. They have 40 years of peace. Until verse 12. Until verse 12, and they do evil again. But, I mean, can you think about this in, in the life of Israel, in the history of Israel? How many times we see this take place? Up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, 40 years, I mean, that's, that's almost a generation. You know, the Bible says a generation is 70 years, or for a strong man, 80 years. So this is, this is almost a generation of people that have had peace. I mean, it says that Othniel was a righteous judge, and, and they had a, a, I mean, they were blessed, they were, they were at peace, they were they're just, they're no longer slaves. But again, we saw that in the Exodus, didn't we? Moses led them out of Egypt and got them out of bondage, out of slavery from their wicked rulers who, who beat them all the time and they get into the, into the wilderness and they begin to murmur and complain and God says, now you're going you're gonna to be stuck here for 40 years because they just don't get it. They're never satisfied. Always looking at self, always looking at flesh, always looking at what they can gain instead of looking to God. And no matter how far you, you wander away from God, you can always cry to Him and come back. That's what we're seeing here. They're, they're in bondage, they're in slavery again. They cry out to God and God says, all right, I'm going to send someone to save them. All of mankind was groaning in sin when God sent Jesus. And we're going to look at him eventually. But when God sent Jesus into this world, what was the purpose? Creation was crying out because of sin. And God heard the cry and sent a deliverer. Same thing's happening here. Israel's crying out to God and he sends Othniel and they get this period of peace. Imagine 
all of the turmoil, all of the trials that they go through with this wicked king being servants in Mesopotamia and, and being treated like you're a second-class citizen or even third-class citizen. I mean, you're not even worth uh, looking at sometimes because you're a slave. And all of a sudden, there's 40 years of peace and tranquility and quietness and blessing. Why would you want to go back? You might remember a quote that I, I, that I mentioned several weeks ago when I preached, you know, that uh, hard times bring strong men and strong men bring good times and good times bring what? Weak men and weak men bring hard times. So when we get blessed and everything's wonderful, we get eased into this, this lifestyle of, man, everything's so good now, I don't have to worry, I don't have to work so hard, I don't have to fret and don't have to pray because I don't have any needs. And this is what happens. And they get lulled into a false sense of peace. And then before you know it, they're right back into sin. In this instance, it took them 40 years. And then there was another transition because they did evil again. And we follow this pattern throughout Israel's history. And it's just amazing how many times God uses this period of judgment to bring about change, to bring about transition, to bring about new life, or, or to bring about a new birth. Whatever it is, God uses this period of time to say, here, it's going to be bad for a while, so you'll turn to me. And, and many times, you know, we get these trials in our lives, and, and, and you know, it might feel like 40 years, but... It might just be a week. <laughs> yeah. But God allows those trials, God allows those difficulties so that we will turn to Him and be willing to say, Lord, I, I just can't do it. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. Uh, I, I, I'm not spiritual enough. I need you. I need you to guide me through this. And that's where that change comes. That's where that new life begins. In that new walk. You realize that as a child of God, we, we, we have a new walk nearly every day because we have to get up and start all over. God, forgive me what I did yesterday. You know, I blew it yesterday. Help me do good today. Help me walk with you today. It's a new life every day. And it's a new blessing every day. You know, we don't need to be like the children of Israel and get tested for 40 years or even 40 days. You know, we just need to learn from their lesson and just say, God, I need you. I can't do it without you. That's all he wants. All God wants is for us to acknowledge his sovereignty in our lives and be willing to follow his leading. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, today for this time. We thank you for these lessons that we can see in the life of Israel and the history of Israel. These different periods of 40 days or 40 years, whatever reason you use that to bring about change in their lives, help us, Lord, not to, not to fall into those traps and, and be willing to just trust you every single day, every step of the way, and understand that, that you always know what is best. And, Lord, we can never go wrong when we follow you. Pray that you'd bless us today as we go our separate ways. Be with the service this morning. Be with pastor as he preaches. May you give him the message that we need for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.